Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this special webinar on hydrogen, its colors, and its relevance to fossil fuel use and the oil and gas industry, as well as to energy policy and legislation. Thank you all for coming. My name is Harv Teitelbaum. I'm on the boards of three of our sponsoring organizations for this webinar, Colorado Rising for Communities, PSR Colorado, which is Physicians for Social Responsibility, and the Environmental Health Project out of Pennsylvania. I'd like to tell you brief, briefly about each of these great organizations. Colorado Rising for Community works to protect Colorado's health, safety, wildlife, environment, and the future of our climate from the impacts of oil and gas development. PSR Colorado works for a healthier Colorado environment by mobilizing health professionals and allies to protect human life from the gravest environmental dangers to human health and survival. The Environmental Health Project defends public health in the face of shale gas development by providing frontline communities with timely monitoring, interpretation, and guidance. Um, you also may find in the, the chat area, you may find links that each of these great organizations is going to share. Uh, links to their websites to find out more information as to what we all do, and perhaps links to sign up for their newsletters in case you want to be kept informed. Um, we are additionally sponsored tonight by the Colorado Hydrogen Network, whose founder and director, Brian De Bruin joins us also. He's waving up there, and I'll be introducing him uh, and his presentation in a moment. I'd also like to thank Claire, Claire Carmelia, who is the Healthy Electric Homes Campaign Coordinator for PSR Colorado, for helping uh, with my slides and the presentation, as, as well as for moderating, moderating the Q&A later on. Um, before we begin, some last, some process points. We'll be doing Q&As after the two presentations, Brian's and mine. Please post any questions you have in the chat area. We do not have a separate Q&A area. Even though we are holding off on answering questions until the end, you may post questions at any time. Please keep all questions and posts respectful, brief, and concise in view of the large number of participants we have. Um, to give everybody a chance, we will probably try to take just one question per person, uh, assuming we get a lot of questions. Um, and um, yeah, we look forward to your questions at, at the end. So now it's time to introduce Brian De Bruin. Brian is an engineer who worked 36 years for Honeywell Aerospace. He is a founder and director of the nonprofit Colorado Hydrogen Network and the chief technical officer for New Day Hydrogen. Brian also hosts the Hydrogen Now Cast podcast and is the chair of the Hydrogen Association's Working Group. Uh, Brian, if you are yeah. unmuted. Um, Claire, if you can take down the that. And Brian, uh, the floor is yours, take it away. All right, well, uh, thank you, Harv, and hello, everyone, Thanks, and thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to speak. Um, as Harv said, my name is Brian DeBru, and I'm an engineer who worked 36 years for Honeywell Aerospace, where I developed uh, new products and programs for military fire aircraft. And near the end of that career, like a lot of us, I was becoming more and more concerned about the environment. And it was clear to me that hydrogen needed to play a key role in the energy transition. So when I left Honeywell, I resolved to become an advocate for hydrogen's role in the energy transition. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit tonight. So I eventually hit upon the idea of starting the nonprofit Colorado Hydrogen Network, which I work for full time. Uh, I don't get paid for that, but uh, I think it's important work. And one of the key goals in doing that was for me to develop hydrogen fuel stations so that we could have fuel cell EVs as an alternative to battery EVs. And um, after a time, I was really incredibly fortunate to be contacted by three other professionals that had the same passion. And we decided to form a company, New Day Hydrogen, to finance and build hydrogen fuel stations. And we're working to make Colorado the next hub for fuel cell vehicles in California. And I do want to mention that um, I, as well as uh, my one of my partners in New Day Hydrogen, Patty Kelly, 
are both members of the Climate Reality Project. That's Al Gore's um, project. And as Harv, Harv mentioned, uh, the other thing I've done is start the Hydrogen Now cast. I'm up to 43 episodes. The 43rd will release uh, about 1 a.m. tonight. And uh, that's to try to get the word out to others about the role of hydrogen and to encourage people, um, and, and we have listeners all over the world, and to encourage them to, to start something and, and get involved and, and do something. So on the screen here, you can see some of my uh, credentials here with some of the links. So I thought it would be really important to start talking about why we need hydrogen. And basically we need hydrogen to replace um, fossil fuels. We need all the functions that the fossil fuels provide. So that sounds kind of obvious, but, but let's think about this for a minute. I mean, fossil fuels are a source of energy. You can dig them out of the ground and they're, they're energy. They're a carrier, they embody that energy. You can move them around. Uh, they can be short, stored for a very short term or long term. I mean, Mother Nature stored them for millions of years. They can be transferred very quickly to vehicles. We get spoiled, I think, with our gasoline and diesel vehicles. We can fuel them up in just a few minutes, probably three minutes, something like that. And that's not to be taken for granted because a lot of other energy systems aren't that fast. Um, fossil fuels have been used for 100, over 100 years in uh, steel making, uh, cement making, that's Portland cement. Uh, glass making and other industrial processes because of the high temperatures that can be achieved and, and other reasons. And then long distance transport. We can put petroleum in pipelines, send it across a continent. We can put it in tankers and send it across the ocean. So if we're going to replace fossil fuels, we've got to have a way to do all of these things. So uh, obviously, as I think we all know, wind and solar are probably the energy source that's going to replace fossil fuels. And there's a few others, geothermal, um, hydroelectric and those kind of things, but generally wind and solar are going to be pretty strong in most places. But they're only a source. They're not really a carrier. You can't store them without some other means. So we add some other things. We add the electric grid, which can be a carrier, not so much across oceans, so uh, not so good for that, but um, we can use them at least across continents. And then of course, batteries, we're all familiar with that with our telephones and some of us have uh, battery cars. Um, we have, my wife and I have a Tesla. And, uh, but really batteries are pretty short term. Uh, batteries tend to self discharge. I don't know if you've ever had that experience with a, a device, you let it sit for, for weeks and all of a sudden the batteries run way down. And for long term, they're expensive, uh, they can be bulky and so forth. And so we've got to have something else. So what, what is that something else? Well, that's hydrogen. So I'll talk about the energy source in a minute because that may be something a little bit new to some of you, but obviously it can be a carrier. It's a molecule. It can embody the energy. It can, you can move it around. You can uh, store it indefinitely as long as your tank doesn't leak. Uh, you could store it for centuries. Um, it's fast transfer to vehicles. If you have a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, it fuels up just as fast as a gas or diesel does. Because hydrogen is a molecule, it can be burned, it can be used in uh, steel and uh, cement making, glass making, paper making, other uh, high temperature industrial processes, and long distance transport. We can put it in pipelines, we can put it in tankers and send it across the ocean. So let me talk for just a second about energy source. Now, what a lot of people don't know is that there are natural deposits, uh, I'll call it, or, or accumulations of hydrogen that can be drilled for, just like you drill a water well. You drill a, a hole in the ground and you can find these sources of hydrogen, which actually are, the process that creates those is an ongoing and sustainable process. So it can be considered renewable and sustainable. And by the way, the first um, hydrogen well in North America is actually in Nebraska. And I visited that this summer in June and, and took a look at that. And then hydrogen from biomass. You know, we have a big problem with uh, sewage and garbage releasing methane. And you can take that and process that into hydrogen, which alleviates that methane release as well as, as, as being a source of hydrogen. All right, so why is hydrogen so useful? Well, there's a characteristic I'll explain here in that electricity and hydrogen basically are interchangeable. We have devices called electrolyzers where you can take uh, water and use electricity to split that H2O into separate hydrogen and oxygen and keep that hydrogen. And you can try this at home, put two spoons or something in a glass of water, add a little bit of salt, 
connect that up to a battery and you'll see hydrogen bubbles off of one and, and oxygen off of the other. And that's the principle here. And that process is reversible in a fuel cell. And electrolyzers and fuel cells look very similar. Uh, if we had two sitting on the table, you'd be hard pressed to tell the difference. They're basically a stack of plastic uh, sheets with some metallization on those. But with a fuel cell, we can take hydrogen and air and turn that back into electricity and we get our water back. And so that's the water vapor. And then of course, in the interim, that hydrogen can be stored or moved around or transported. So really, I'd like you to think of electricity and hydrogen of being two sides of the renewable energy coin. And that's, that's why there's such a buzz right now about hydrogen, because it's so incredibly useful to support renewable electricity in the energy transition. So of course, uh, people hear that uh, you're, you're splitting water to make hydrogen and they wonder, does it use a lot of water? Well, not really. The average restaurant, just a modest restaurant uses about eight times the water of an average hydrogen fuel station. So by average, I mean uh, 75 cars a day, that's probably an average station. And then average restaurant is just your local uh, you know, strip mall type of restaurant, not, not a huge mega restaurant. All right, so talked a little bit already about the sources of hydrogen. We can split water with electricity. Talked about the renewable hydrogen wells. And by the way, if you're interested in that, you can um, go to the website for natural hydrogen energy. That's nh2e.com. And there's also a tech brief on the Colorado Hydrogen Network website that explains this, uh, not in a lot more detail, but a little bit. And as I said earlier, this natural hydrogen is sustainable and renewable. We can make hydrogen from biomass. Um, a little bit of a mantra here, garbage, sewage, forest, slash, almost sounds like a cheerleading chant, but um, certainly a good use of that. And uh, heaven knows we've got an awful lot of uh, dead trees in Colorado. And if we could uh, use some of those for lumber and take the slash and turn it into either biochar or uh, hydrogen, um, that might make it economically feasible. And uh, biomass, by the way, could be greenhouse um, negative if you sequester the carbon. And so that's an option as well. Um, so we could rely on plants to pull the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, convert that, um, those plants into hydrogen and then sequester the carbon and we'd be pulling carbon out of the air without a lot of expensive machinery. And then the last one is um, something that I don't think will be with us a long time, but we currently have some nuclear power plants and we can certainly use the heat and electricity from those to make hydrogen. Now, I, I'm not an advocate of, of nuclear power, by the way, because of the uh, waste, the nuclear waste, which we've never found a solution for. But um, be that as it may, it is one possibility. And then, um, obviously, Harv's going to talk to this, hydrogen from fossil fuels. And my only comment there is not recommended. All right, so I think a good way to think about this is that in the past, both our electricity and hydrogen came from fossil fuels, but in the future, I don't think either will, and certainly neither uh, have to. So let's talk a little bit about um, the color of hydrogen. And this is kind of getting, bringing us around to Har's uh, talk. And really what color is meant to be is just a very quick shorthand to specify two things with one idea or one name. And those two things are, is the source renewable or not? And does it emit carbon or not? So if we show this as a table with rows and columns here, the columns are yes or no to does it emit CO2 or CO2 equivalent, I guess we could even say. And then the, the rows are, is it renewable or is it non-renewable? And so uh, pretty self-explanatory here, if it does not emit carbon dioxide and it's from renewable energy, it's considered green. And I'm gonna to talk to the degree of this in a minute. If it does not emit CO2, but it's not renewable, well, technically that's blue. And then if it does emit CO2 and it's non-renewable, obviously that's, that's gray. Some people call that brown. And then you'll notice I've added one here that you probably haven't seen before, which is tan. And um, I don't know if I have the, uh, the, the clout to get the world to accept something like this, but I'll, I'll put it out there. And that is, uh, we have to consider that hydrogen made from biomass without carbon capture would be tan. Now, if it's made from biomass with carbon capture, that would be green. So... I don't uh, subscribe to all these other colors, the pinks and the uh, chartreuse or, what, or turquoise or whatever they've got out there for hydrogen. I think that's done by people who don't understand 
what the colors really mean. And they've uh, just willy nilly come up with extra colors. And I, I don't, uh, I don't subscribe to that. So, all right. And now let's kind of talk about shades of this uh, and which is again, getting back to what Harv's going to talk about really nothing in life is absolute, you know, is electricity from a solar panel, truly green. Well, not really because there was fossil energy used to create the aluminum and the glass and the semiconductors. And, you know, is a battery EV truly green? Well, not really, because, you know, the grid isn't 100% green yet. And you really don't know where you're going to be charging sometimes if you're traveling. So obviously, we need something more than color. A color is just a shorthand. It's a quickie. It's just to, to give us an idea of, of the range. But what we really want to talk about is the carbon intensity score. And that's a figure of merit or a score for any energy source, which usually includes other greenhouse gases. For example, if you're using natural gas to make hydrogen, even if you capture 100% of that carbon dioxide, there were probably methane leaks in the process getting there. And so that really needs to be included in whoever, whatever company you are, whoever you are making that hydrogen, you really need to give uh, a, a proper and a true uh, carbon intensity uh, score. And just to make this maybe a little more clear, the, the units here are are basically grams of CO2 equivalent per energy. And units of energy, kilowatt hours, uh, joules, BTUs, uh, there's a lot of units of energy that are interchangeable. You just need a conversion factor, but that's what a carbon intensity score means. It's how many grams of CO2 per unit of energy. All right, so uh, to wrap things up, maybe just to recap here, uh, the takeaways is that really both hydrogen and renewable electricity are gonna be essential if we're gonna replace all the functions of fossil fuels. And in the past, as I said earlier, our electricity and hydrogen came from fossil fuels, but in the future, neither will, we hope. And there are plenty of environmentally friendly ways to obtain good hydrogen. And when judging any energy source, what really matters is that carbon intensity score. So again, here's my email. It's also in the chat. If um, you're more than welcome to contact me, you can also reach out to me through the Colorado um, Hydrogen Network uh, website, which is there. And I'd encourage you all to uh, listen to a few ep episodes of the Hydrogen Nowcast. Uh, a few are pretty dry and pretty technical, but I think you'll get a kick out of some of them. Um, I did one that was actually a little bit humorous talking about what EV would Einstein buy. So you might, uh, you might even start with that. So uh, that's it. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about my favorite subject. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and share this now. Thanks. Thanks, Brian, for a great, great presentation. Uh, while we're waiting here, I wanted to also uh, thank um, Lauren Swain, who's helping out with some of the uh, logistics here on admitting people and making sure that that everything is running smoothly. So thank you, Lauren. Lauren is also with PSR Colorado. Um, okay, so I'll start. Uh, first, I should introduce myself. Um, as I said before, my name is Harv Teitelbaum. I'm on the boards of three of our sponsoring organizations. I was also um, chair of the Sierra Club's Beyond Oil and Gas um, campaign for a few years. I was executive director of a local soil conservation district. I worked with the Colorado Division of Wildlife for five years in the education department. And I was an adjunct instructor of environmental science for 10 years. There's a little bit of background on my master's degree is in something called eco psychology and environmental leadership. So we're gonna talk about fracked hydrogen. Uh, this is what um, Brian referred to as gray and blue, but uh, next slide, please. Um, first, just uh, Brian, I borrowed your, uh, your graphic from New Day Hydrogen um, to show um, what is considered green. Now when we talk about the colors of hydrogen, as Brian said, there's nothing set in stone. These are just kind of agreed to by people who who work in the field and, and industry. And so green is considered the, uh, uh, excuse the mixed metaphors, but it's considered the gold standard of, of hydrogen. It is sustainably, it can be sustainably sourced. 
and it could have sustainable inputs and sustainable outputs. As Brian said, through electrolysis, we break water up into its component parts, hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, currently, green hydrogen is more expensive than gray. Um, and that's why the, the vast majority of hydrogen produced today is gray. But because there are so many advances happening all the time in green hydrogen, in the electrolysis process, in, um, with the catalysts, uh, there's an expected cost parity uh, time of approximately 2030, when they expect the, the cost to be equalized between uh, green and gray. Next slide, please. So what is gray hydrogen? So gray hydrogen takes fossil gas, what we're all used to when we discuss fracking, uh, takes fossil gas and subjects it to what's called a steam reforming process or steam methane reforming or SMR and, and breaks it up into the hydrogen. Uh, it has a, it's a multi-stage process, but two of the most important stages are uh, initially they take the, the methane. Uh, and again, I should say that the fossil gas, what the industry likes to call uh, natural gas, the gas that's extracted is between 75 and 95% methane, the rest being things like ethane and pentane, uh, things like that. But um, we're after the, the methane, the CH4. So they take the, the methane, the CH4, and they subject it to uh, intense pressure, intense steam pressure, uh, under which it's reformed as hydrogen and carbon monoxide. Then a further step takes that carbon monoxide and subjects that to the, the uh, steam, the high pressure steam process and breaks that and reforms it into carbon dioxide and more hydrogen. And if it's gray hydrogen, that carbon dioxide is often just released into the atmosphere. It's important to note that there are, it takes a lot of energy to, uh, to heat up, to superheat that steam and to run the SMR process. That extra energy comes from combusting more natural gas uh, to, run, to run that process. But at this point, approximately 96% of the world's manufactured hydrogen is gray. And I should say also that um, this is, per, uh, for the most part, this is fracking. Uh, since we get at least two thirds of our um, natural gas from fracking, I'll be talking about gray hydrogen and blue hydrogen in terms of fracking. Next slide, please. So what is blue hydrogen? Okay, so blue hydrogen essentially takes gray hydrogen and adds CCS. Uh, CCS stands for carbon capture and storage. Sometimes it is called carbon capture and sequestration. And uh, one of the variations is they add the word transport on there. And um, sometimes instead of storage sequestration, they'll, they'll add utilization. So it'll be carbon capture, transport and storage utilization, a uh, big long thing that, you know, some of these variations is bas basically it's CCS. And this graphic here is a, a simplified version of what happens with CCS in a, um, a, a oil and gas fracking or capture situation. Uh, the, the CO2 after the um, the steam methane re reforming process, the CO2, is captured, separated, and sent to a compression unit where it is compressed for transport. It can be compressed even down to a liquid, and it's transported uh, either to be uh, utilized in an industrial setting for industrial uh, uses or uh, for injection under the ground and for storage. It can also be used reused by the oil and gas industry in various processes. They have a process called EOR, EOR, which stands for Enhanced Oil Recovery, where they inject the CO2 into the ground to try to force up whatever oil was remaining, the hard to get oil. They force up the oil and they leave the CO2 underground in its place. 
There's also a form of fracking that uses CO2, a CO2 fracking that I believe is used in China in parts um, in place of uh, full, full um, fracking fluid. So that's blue hydrogen. It's basically gray, gray hydrogen that is uh, with CCS added to it. Next slide, please. But there are issues with carbon capture and storage or utilization. Um, one uh, report, um, comprehensive report in Forbes, and I'll quote here, I'll have to get some windows out of the way, you'll have to excuse me for a moment. Um, the costs of carbon capture and storage are high and will require heavy subsidies and a carbon pricing mechanism to promote their application. If fossil fuels continue to overproduce, an enormous new industry for CCS will have to be created at least as large as the present oil and gas industry and possibly twice as large. In other words, he's talking if we switch completely to blue hydrogen uh, for home fuel, for home energy, for building energy, for heating, cooking, um, and uh, hot water heat, uh, this is gonna create the need for a, a, a huge market to handle uh, the CCS. It makes more sense, Forbes goes on to say, to reduce the actual production of oil and gas because fossil fuel production and CCS together will be too cumbersome and expensive for energy firms to manage compared to renewable energies. Next slide, please. Now, this is from a report um, on Climate Wire reported in Scientific American. It was a report, uh, a study done at Princeton and um, again, I first, I first would uh, reiterate that there are no federal regulations regarding CCS storage or sequestration. So the, um, the Princeton researchers say that shale gas production through hydraulic fracturing, through fracking can compromise future use of the shale as a, as a cap rock formation in a CO2 storage operation. Um, the, uh, the research has gone to say that 80% of the potential area to store CO2 underground in the United States could be restrained by shale and tight gas development. In other words, what they're saying is that the same places that are, uh, would be used to store CO2 are, are good targets for, for fracking. So uh, using um, one area for fracking compromises its use for uh, for storage and vice versa. They conclude, the researchers from Princeton, that carbon capture and storage in deep rock formations or saline aquifers currently has never been proved at scale. Next slide, please. So uh, that's some of the background of blue hydrogen. Blue hydrogen, again, take, takes gray hydrogen, which has used uh, steam methane reforming to split CH4 into hydrogen and carbon dioxide. Blue takes that and adds carbon capture to that. So, but we need to, when we look at the whole process to see if blue hydrogen is good for the climate and will not release a large amount of climate, uh, climate changes, um, Hang on a second, my, apparently my mic has gone down. So, We had a slight disruption about a moment ago um, and I thought it might've been just, just me, but I moment, please. Uh, increased the volume, it seemed to work. Can somebody tell me if I'm back on line with my, my microphone? We, we can hear you, Harv, but it went down in volume up quite a bit. Okay, well, I hope you can still hear me now. I take but, the couch. You're very low. Thumbs up if I'm still. All you do is turn up your volume you on can your still computer. Hear me. Just turn up your volume to hear it.
Can you hear me now? Anyone? Perfect. Well, you're still um, good. Thank you, uh, Harvey. You're still very quiet. If you click on the so up we need carrot to look next to the entire your... life cycle of blue hydrogen, when we want to consider whether or not it is good for the environment and whether or not it is as good as green hydrogen and good enough to be lumped together with green. So what are the stages in blue hydrogen in the blue hydrogen process where carbon, uh, greenhouse gases and toxic emissions and leakage points occur? Uh, so let's look at stage one, which is the production of blue hydrogen. We have the same drilling, boring, injecting, fracking fluid, the same processes for blue hydrogen that are there with regular fracking. Uh, these include um, unknown long-term consequences of the fracking fluid, flow, flow back and produced water issues, pouring of casements, uh, et cetera. Next, next slide, please. Uh, so let's look at the leakage points throughout the fracking process. Next slide, please. So this is a uh, graphic from the movie Gasland. And you can see this is some of the leakage points that we get from fracking. There are leakage points in the casement, uh, leakage points that can get into the aquifers, in transportation, in the storage units, in surface ponds. So numerous leaking, uh, leakage points for, for methane uh, to get back into our air, soil, and water. Next slide, please. So that's stage one, the production stage. Stage two, which is the steam methane reforming and the um, carbon capture and storage, both SMR and CCS require energy inputs, energy that comes from combusting additional methane, similar to the clean coal um, marketing campaign that happened a few years ago that they uh, try to sell clean coal as a clean technology. But to clean the coal, it took extra, extra energy, which came from burning more coal. So they had to um, mine more coal just to make the clean coal. So here we have a similar thing that to run these processes, we need to uh, combust more methane. And there's no requirement that the energy inputs needed for SMR or CCS be sustainably derived. Next slide, please. So uh, going on, we now look at stage three of the whole process of uh, blue hydrogen. Stage three is post carbon capture and storage. Again, there are no national regulations. Indeed, some of that captured carbon according to Helios Industry, which is a sustainable research firm, um, some of that captured carbon is reused as a feedstock for uh, industrial applications in which the CO2 is still ultimately released into the atmosphere. So uh, there are no guarantees as to where some of that carbon dioxide winds up. Next slide, please. There's one more concept I want to introduce here, and that's the concept of carbonates. Um, when we talk about storage and sequestration, how long do we want to require it to um, be held? How long is our expectation of its storage? Well, the American Forest Foundation and the Nature Conservancy um, have this, this term that they use called permanence. And permanence is defined in the carbon context as the longevity of the carbon benefit of at least 100 years. Permanence is a critical attribute of a true carbon benefit because it gets at the root of a meaningful impact in fighting cl climate change. Emissions that are removed or reduced need to be permanently removed or reduced in order to reduce the CO2 equivalents in our atmosphere. So that's another, another uh, concept to be uh, uh, kept kept in mind the the uh, the issue of permanence. So uh, thank you, Claire. The uh, so the next um, next thing to consider is after we've looked at all these stages and all their issues, how much real climate benefit do we wind up getting from blue? And this is a very uh, turned out to be a very um, wide widely read study came out a few months ago. Uh, it was published in the um, New York Times and I think the Denver Post and other papers. Uh, it's the uh, the Hoarth Jacobson study, 
This is from uh, Bob Howarth and uh, Mark Jacobson from Cornell and Stanford. Uh, many of us know Bob Howarth, who along with Tony and Grafia did a lot of the, um, the seminal work on methane emissions from fracking and how much methane is actually being, being put into the atmosphere uh, by fracking. Uh, but Howarth and Jacobson studied the emissions, the, the full life cycle emissions from the blue hydrogen um, production cycle. And they concluded that far from being low carbon, greenhouse gas emissions from the production of blue hydrogen are quite high, particularly due to the release of fugitive methane, as we saw from all those points in the production uh, process, the production stage, uh, methane leaks into the atmosphere. It leaks at about a rate of, according to Howarth and Ingrafia and other studies, between 3.5 and 3.7% of production leaks into the atmosphere. So they also go on to say that the, to the total carbon dioxide equivalent emissions for blue hydrogen are only nine to 12% less than for gray hydrogen. And while carbon dioxide emissions may be lower, fugitive methane emissions for blue, blue hydrogen are actually higher than for gray hydrogen because of an increased use of natural gas to power the carbon capture. In other words, as we said before, the additional energy needed to power those processes for uh, both uh, reforming um, the methane into hydrogen and for the carbon capture um, make it much more um, methane intensive. Um, so, and they conclude that our analysis assumes that, well, they, it's not a conclusion, but they say that our analysis assumes that captured carbon dioxide can be stored indefinitely in an optimistic and unproven assumption. Even if it were true, uh, the use of blue hydrogen appears difficult to justify on climate grounds. So, uh, next slide, please. So, what are the oil and gas industry's plans for consumer hydrogen? What do they want to do in homes and buildings in the future? What they want to do is blend hydrogen with regular methane, so-called natural gas, for what can be called a cleaner fuel, uh, improving the industry's sustainability image and extending out the practice of fracking. There are obstacles to doing this. Um, and one of the obstacles we, we talked about uh, before is the carbon capture. Where are they gonna put uh, the captured carbon? How are they gonna use it? Um, how is that gonna affect where the, their plans for more fracking sites? But also they, they need to figure out, will all gas appliances, especially older appliances, run on gas blends? Um, we know now through studies that are done out at uh, SoCal Gas that um, viability of blends has been shown to be um, um, efficacious at, at up to 20%. 20% blends they've, they've tried out and they successfully, uh, home appliances success, successfully use 20% blends of, of um, methane and hydrogen. Another obstacle is that current steel pipelines are incompatible with sending pure hydrogen a um, condition called embrittlement takes place where the embrittlement breaks down, uh, breaks down those pipelines. Um, but um, there are solutions to that. First of all, they can line the pipelines with polymers or plastics. Um, they can also, uh, we also know from studies that they can send blends in the pipelines up to a certain point and they won't be, um, uh, it, they won't have an embrittlement process if they keep it under a certain per percentage. Um, they, can, um, they can also send things like uh, ammonia through pipelines and, and get hydrogen that way. Um, so those are some of the plans, the obstacles, and some of the solutions uh, for the industry in using hydrogen in homes and buildings. Next slide, please. Okay, so the industry is already laying the groundwork for this. Um, 
what they want to do is initially to normalize the concept of blue hydrogen on the state and federal level. How do they do that? They do it by uh, pairing or conflating blue and green in policy and legislation under the joint heading low carbon. Uh, they hope to create a false equivalency while diverting funding and focus away from, from green. Next slide, please. I'll give you an example here. Uh, this is uh, legislation from Colorado. Uh, this is SB 21264. Uh, without going into the technicalities of it, it's a, uh, a bill and now an act that um, encourages utilities to adopt clean heat plans to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And in this act, um, I quote uh, here, the green and blue hydrogen have the potential to be zero or very low carbon sources. It uh, further goes on to say, a gas dis distribution utility may include proposals to make investments in green or blue hydrogen project projects that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So this, uh, this bill uh, lumps green and blue together under the category of low carbon sources. Next slide, please. Here's an example of a federal um, legislation, the recently passed infrastructure bill. It includes $9.5 billion to support the creation of a clean hydrogen industry. But much of the money is going to support the US um, whoops, did we lose it, Claire? Apologies, I'm not sure what just happened. There we are. <laughs> Continue. Thank you. That might have been uh, <laughs> my uh, person might have inadvertently hit the hydrogen industry link there. Can you make that uh, full screen again? Thank you. Um, so back one slide. Okay, so the recently passed infrastructure bill includes $9.5 billion to support the creation of a clean hydrogen industry. But much of the money, this is as reported in dsmog.com, much of the money is going to support the US fracked gas industry under the guise of clean blue hydrogen. Um, while being presented as a clean hydrogen plan for decarbonizing the energy system, the main focus of the hydrogen section of the bill is to continue and expand the use of natural gas, that is methane, in the US economy via what's known as blue hydrogen. Bloomberg recently reported that US Senator Joe Manchin played a powerful role in, in shaping the components of the infrastructure bill that support the use of fracked shale gas as a feedstock for hydrogen production. However, even Manchin has recently admitted that carbon capture isn't a realistic solution. And those are my bolds, by the way, uh, my, my highlights. Next slide, please. And here's an example of, of, of um, pairing of blue and green in energy policy. This is a recently issued um, Roadmap from the Colorado State Energy Office, Opportunities for Low Carbon Hydrogen in Colorado, the Roadmap. Now the report was compiled by Energy and Environmental Economics Inc or E3, they're out of San Francisco. And these are quotes from the, from the report. This roadmap refers to low carbon hydrogen as hydrogen produced with significantly reduced life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. This, this encompasses both blue hydrogen and green hydrogen. But they go on to say that uh, uh, standardized or consistent definitions of low carbon hydrogen have not yet been established. So they join the two, blue and green, under the heading of low carbon, uh, even though there's not been any definitions of low carbon hydrogen established at this point. Uh, next slide, please. And that's just a graphic of the, the cover of the, the roadmap. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, key takeaways from, from this. Um, I come away with, uh, from my research with three key takeaways. 
Number one, that gray hydrogen is dirty, polluting, and has significant climate impacts. Number two, blue hydrogen, as shown by Howarth and Jacobson, is not demonstrably, demonstrably better considering its continuing, continuing emission points, methane fuel inputs, and uncertain carbon disposition. Number three, the oil and gas industry is relying on the image of blue, both as a pleasing color, the closest thing to green, and as a process to promote fracked blue hydrogen as a viable, low carbon, sustainable energy source for the future, equivalent to green in legislation, policy, and society. And I'll ask the question, is this greenwashing or not? Um, last slide, please. So, I've been an activist for over 50 years, so I can't, I can't just end a slideshow without having some possible actions to take. Um, and so I've, I have three possible actions for people if they're interested in pursuing um, the issue of blue hydrogen versus green. Uh, first of all, search all energy and climate related bills and legislations for the keywords hydrogen green hydrogen or blue hydrogen. Next, carefully consider any provisions elevating blue to low carbon or sustainable status, pairing it with green and thereby commingling uh, research and development, subsidies and policies. Advocate for a decoupling of green and blue with green given preferential treatment. Um, and lastly, and this is a little, this is probably a, a little more out there, um, as we've been saying, there is no official definition of what constitutes blue hydrogen. So perhaps we can advocate for one. And my idea would be to ask for definitions for all three stages um, in the production um, and manufacture of blue hydrogen. Uh, first in stage one, um, Perhaps a requirement would be that uh, there be certified total methane leakage emissions of less than 1% and not the 3.5 to 3.7 that there is currently. Um, in stage two, uh, we could request that blue hydrogen have all energy inputs uh, be sustainably derived and not de derived from fossil fuels. And for stage three, uh, certified minimum 100 year permanence to any carbon capture or sequestration. Um, th so that could be possibly um, a, an official definition for blue hydrogen. Um, so that completes um, my presentation. Uh, it's my hope and I know there's, there's, uh, there's opinion and there are conclusions that I've derived from, from research here. So, but it's my hope that the presentation gives you kind of a good foundational understanding of the basic principles and issues at play. So if you want to get involved, you can be active participants in the public dialogue on hydrogen. Um, so uh, Claire, if you can take- Absolutely. Just, uh, so I'm going to put up some screens. notes here because we had quite a few questions and right when I had my little uh, slide um, debacle. I have to ask everybody that um, we're going to be taking Q and A from the from the chat, and not from people raising their hands because not everybody has uh, video capabilities. So if you have a question, please put it as we stated up front. Uh, please put it in the in the chat, and we'll try to get to. Um, uh, get to as many questions as we can. We only have about five minutes or so, but we, we'll stay we'll stay late um, as late as we can. Um, so I Karen, would like to ask any questions uh, for either me or Brian. I do. Are you able to hear me, Harv? Harv cannot hear me. Okay. Uh, how about the rest of the audience? Is the rest of the audience able to hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Perfect. Okay. Well. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to uh, get Harv's audio so that he can hear the audience. So he's not going to be able to hear our questions. So Lauren, if you're Claire, present, Claire, I can't hear you. Lauren, would you be able to, to type out the questions to him as I say them out loud?
Yes. That would be amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So first and foremost, will the webinar be available as a recording? I believe that we did capture this as a recording. Um, the slide decks we definitely have available. And Brian, if you are comfortable with making yours available as well, right. then we can uh, make that available for everyone. That is not a problem. Um, I captured many of the questions, but uh, I happened to click on a link right when we were having that slide issue. So if you see a question that's not here, put it in the chat and we'll get it at the end. Uh, do we have any numbers for the CI score for various types of hydrogen production versus solar and scalability versus environmental impact? Well, I will say that those probably exist somewhere. We'd have to do a, a web search. I don't know what they are off the top of my head, and I haven't really searched for those, but I would be surprised if they're not available. Okay, fair enough. From what our information gives us, how much hydrogen deposits exist and what could existing deposits power? Well, that's a little bit unknown because at this point in time, this is a fairly new technology of finding this sustainable, renewable underground hydrogen. Well, the hydrogen be. does uh, seep out in many places in the world. As a matter of fact, the original uh, Olympic torch is power or was uh, brought from a, a hydrogen source that's burning in Turkey, and it's, it's still burning after all these thousands of years. But uh, we don't know yet uh, the technology to find the hydrogen and develop that is still under development, but we think it's fairly substantial just based on some of the natural um, emissions of hydrogen uh, around the world in, in various places. Okay, so there's substantial hydrogen amounts available. Um, what happens to all the VOCs and HAPs when the natural gas is cracked? When we say cracked, I'm not sure if that means fracked or cracked. Well, I think what they're asking there is um, when we uh, basically do steam methane reforming to change natural gas into carbon dioxide and hydrogen. And uh, I assume the other VOCs are, are leaked. That's why we're a lot of us are against that. Okay. Is hydrogen a greenhouse gas? Yeah, hydrogen is considered a greenhouse gas, but it's extremely reactive with oxygen and other things that will form water. So it, uh, there isn't very much hydrogen in the atmosphere. Okay. Uh, this seems to have similar problems as oil in terms of releasing more carbon in the air and requires fracking. Um, I guess that's more of a comment, I, but I'll allow you to refute or agree with that. Well, you know, the way I put it is the reason we're developing hydrogen is to replace natural gas or replace petroleum, basically. And so why does it make sense to turn petroleum into hydrogen? I mean, you'd be probably better off, as Harvest pointed out, to just use the petroleum. So um, it's, it's not a good system and it, it's not necessary either. We can use renewable electricity mm -hmm. to make hydrogen. We don't need to make it from petroleum. It's just we have a huge industry out there that uh, is going to go away and <laughs> they're trying to protect their turf, I think. Right. Um, we did not really cover tan hydrogen. Do you want to give a brief summary of what that is? Well, that's my own creation to give a color to something that we don't have a color for right now, which is making hydrogen from biomass. And I think I, I saw there's another question, maybe we're coming to it. Uh, uh, someone had commented that um, hydrogen made from biomass is not carbon negative, and it's not. If, you, if a plant grows and you turn it into carbon dioxide and release that and then you, and also turn it into hydrogen, at best, that's carbon neutral. What I was trying to get across, though, was that if you grow plants and then uh, turn them into hydrogen and carbon dioxide and you sequester that carbon, put it in the ground, turn it, you can turn that into actually solid carbon. So it doesn't have the issues of a gas like carbon dioxide, then that could be carbon negative And that could be a way to remove some carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Thank you. What did I should say? I, I, I can hear you now. Oh, excellent. Okay. <laughs> Glad to have you back, Harv. Uh, feel free to chime in then. Uh, Brian's been answering the questions. Thank you so much. So, yep, I'm going to go ahead and keep going through these questions. Uh, the next question I think I'm going to skip over. Um, it, it's more of a comment on climate change, which is true and unfortunate. Uh, the next one we have, where and when does it make sense in terms of energy efficiency to produce hydrogen using electricity? with the hydrogen then used to generate electricity as compared to using electricity directly? Uh, that, that's a great question. And as a matter of fact, we are just about at parity with uh, uh, blue hydrogen here in Colorado. 
in other words, using, using renewable electricity with published XL rates, uh, we can get very close to the same cost um, in producing hydrogen that way. Now, that's not the case everywhere. California has real expensive electricity, which is why they've more relied on other means of, of getting their hydrogen rather than electrolysis. But we're getting very close. And indeed, if you were to put an electrolyzer right at a wind turbine or a solar uh, array, uh, you can actually make hydrogen cheaper today than, um, than from uh, petroleum products. So we're getting very close. That's exciting. Okay, uh, what are the implication and impacts of ethane cracker plants? Well, that's yours. yeah. Uh, well, it, interesting you should mention that because, um, and by the way, I just wanna mention here, I, I had a, a complete um, uh, hard drive breakdown. So I'm without a computer and I'm borrowing equipment, which is why I've had a little technical issues tonight. Um, when I mentioned that uh, one of the solutions to embrittlement was to line the pipelines with plastic or polymers, uh, that plastic or polymers would come from uh, those cracker plants. Um, remember, I mentioned that um, when we frack uh, for the methane, uh, between 75 and 95 percent of what they get is, uh, is methane. So that means between 5 and 25 percent is not. And what is that? Um, part of the, that is ethane. And that goes to ethane cracker plants, uh, which use a tremendous amount of, of energy and, um, and are, are very, uh, very polluting. And that's, that's where the ethane from fracking goes to be made into plastics. And that would be used if, if we do wind up using plastic or polymer lined pipelines, that's how, where the ethane would be, would be used, so. Okay. And what happens to the BTX when fracked gas is cracked with steam? Does it become an aqueous, <laughs> an aqueous stink ooze? I, I, I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, how sustainable is green really in the water, sir, in the water starved Southwest? I, I love this question because, you know, as I pointed out, uh, a, a hydrogen fuel station is going to use le much less water, one eighth the water of a restaurant. And I once uh, ran the numbers, if every single vehicle that's run in Colorado was running off of hydrogen, the amount of water it would take is 0.04% of the agricultural water that's used in Colorado. So if we're worried about water, we need to be stop growing marginal crops on dry land and uh, go, go grow those crops somewhere else. So um, the, the amount of water that creation of hydrogen takes is really pretty insignificant. And I, I will say one other thing, and that is that what is coming is going to be hybrid fuel cell vehicles. As a matter of fact, Toyota just announced today that they're going to make the Prius or Prius, however you want to pronounce that vehicle, uh, available as a fuel cell um, plug-in hybrid vehicle. So that means it has a battery and it has a fuel cell. So if you're driving to the store to work, you just plug it in at home and charge it, and you probably never have to run the fuel cell. And then if you decide to go to Chicago from here or to New York or something and drive, um, then you can rely on the fuel cell to extend that. And so to me, that is, that is the killer app for transportation is a, a hybrid plug-in vehicle, which will be coming. And that, of course, is going to need even less hydrogen and, of course, then less water. I would also mention that um, as far as the water usage, um, think about uh, coastal areas. I mean, this doesn't have the potential to, uh, to lower sea levels, but um, imagine if uh, we do have the desalinization problem, but uh, I can see this being something on the coastal areas that might, um, might be viable uh, for the source of water. Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that. All right. And then uh, is there specific legislation nationally or locally that we should look at and call? That's a great question also, because um, the infrastructure bill uh, was the place to, to, to really to look at, but then it's a bit of a catch-22. Um, Manchin was gonna, wasn't going to go along with the infrastructure bill unless he got um, funding for, for hydrogen, uh, for blue hydrogen. Uh, so you know, it's the politics of the possible sometimes. You have to make uh, concessions and, and compromises. So right now, I think the best place to look is at the state level. 
because I think the industry is working state, uh, state by state uh, to work in this equivalency of blue and green hydrogen under the heading of low hydrogen without any sort of uh, qualification or definitions. And we have to question that and we have to really, um, you know, kind of parse out. Uh, and it's also educational. Some legislators may not know uh, the ins and outs of, of both blue and green and gray hydrogen. So I think the state level is the place to go first. Okay. And the next question we did already answer. I realize we are five minutes over, but I believe there are more questions if we want to take them from those who have their hands raised. Uh, are we okay with maybe five more minutes of questions? Sure. Okay. I'm, fine. I'm fine with that now that I've gotten all the technical things out of the way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Uh, I see that David Heeman has, has his hand up for a little while now. David? Wait. Okay. I've unmuted him. David, uh, you have the mic. Oh, that's me. I didn't even know I had my hand up. Well, I had a question of uh, why is the industry pushing blue hydrogen if carbon capture and sequestration makes it economically infeasible for them? I don't know. Well, um, I, I wouldn't say it, it makes it uh, uneconomical or infeasible. Uh, they're basically sitting on a lot of assets of equipment and, and resources. <laughs> they, want to, they want to do something with it. And, uh, you know, natural reaction, you can't blame them. But from the world's perspective, I think there's a better places to get hydrogen than out of petroleum. Yeah, and I would just add that most fracking is not economically viable. Mm -hmm. um, most, most fracking in Colorado, uh, from my understanding, uh, does, is, is not a big money maker, but um, I don't want to get into some of the uh, uh, some of those the financing things. But they need to keep fracking to pay the debt service um, on the the financing that they previous, previously received. Uh, so it's it's not clear that fracking itself is economically viable. Uh, I think that they do these things in, in hope that. Um, they can get support, federal support, the subsidies, the backing um, to, uh, to, keep, uh, to keep pushing it. Um, also, there, there's a hope that they can develop markets. Uh, the non-sequestration part of CCS, that is the utilization part of it, that they may be able to develop markets that are financially beneficial. Uh, but I, I agree, it's a good question. It's not clear that the whole thing is... Uh, economically sustainable. That's true with um, the nuclear industry as well. Yeah, agreed. Uh, Harvard, let me add one more thing. And that is all of us as, as activists that would like to see petroleum go away. I don't think the way to do it is by trying to shut off the supply because that, you know, there's gotta be, <laughs> demand has gotta be met somehow. We all need to um, get our groceries delivered to the store and uh, drive our vehicles and so forth. What I've tried to do is to try to develop the alternatives. And I've chosen to focus on the fuel cell vehicles because I think a lot of people aren't going to be willing to buy battery vehicles. I just heard a, a, a survey the other day, 67% uh, of the people out there say they're not at all thinking about buying a battery vehicle right now. So I think what, what we can do that'll help the most is to try to come up with alternatives in transportation, in um, building heating, which is probably the, the hardest one. I don't even know of a solution there um, and other things work for those solutions because that will displace the, the oil industry. If they don't have customers, they aren't, they'll, they'll go away. <laughs> but they aren't, I don't think we can make them go away by shutting them off because then we'll all starve. Well, and if I could add to that, because uh, a couple of things, as you know, um, um, I work with Healthy Electric Homes and uh, I made it uh, uh, with the help of Colorado Rising and PSR, uh, I made a TV commercial uh, about the health dangers of using gas stoves. And we provided alternatives at the end of that, induction or electric stoves or heat pumps, heat pump uh, for um, home heating, for air conditioning, for hot water, uh, heat. So the alternatives are there. I personally believe that we need to work on both the supply and demand sides at the same time. 
Uh, we need to uh, work on the fracking end of it. Um, we need to work on the demand side, on the on the, the use end of it. We need, to, we need to work on the regulatory end of it, on the political side to, of it, campaign contributions, uh, media influence, the whole package. There's nothing, there's nothing that needs to be ignored. But I agree that fracking, I don't believe that fracking should be banned overnight. Uh, there, are, there are many people working in that industry, but we need to transition away from that and we need to transition to healthy electric homes as, as quickly as possible. Yeah, really good points. And um, maybe if I can just clarify my point about it, especially home heating, and that is that people don't replace their furnace, right? I, I've got a boiler in my house that dates 1985. And I looked into going to a heat pump and it was horribly expensive. A new boiler is $2,000. A heat pump at the time was $14,000. So when I say that's kind of an intractable problem, it's more on the economic side and maybe the social side, definitely not on the technical. We have technical solutions. It's just, do we, do we go around and, and give everyone a lot of money to replace their furnace? Maybe, maybe, we have, maybe it comes to that at some point. Um, but uh, that, that's why I think that is one of the harder problems. So, Right, I agree with you on that. And I think as, as appliances need to be replaced, uh, you transition incrementally as, as, your, uh, as your means allow. Um, you know, I had a 30-year-old electric stove and I replaced it, uh, when it when it gave out. So that's the way to do it, you know, to look for the, the best technology when it's time. Yeah, it's just, is attrition fast enough? Maybe not, but we'll, we'll have to deal with that someday. <laughs> okay. We got? Well, I don't see any more hands raised, and I'm sure that there were more questions in the chat that I didn't get to, but as seeing as we are just over 10 over, I think that we're okay to wrap up unless, do I see anyone else raising a hand for a last minute question? Did I miss any questions while I was off and you uh, uh, No, I think Brian uh, had you covered pretty well there. So. Oh, there's Steve, Steve Douglas, uh, Representative Douglas, I see a hand up there. Yes. Uh, let's see if we can. Uh... Representative Douglas, what can we answer for you? Oh, no, I'm not a representative. That's my wife. I was previously <laughs> uh, elected official. Oh, you were uh, sorry council, about that. councilman. Right? Yeah, a, pre a former representative. Sorry about that, Arp. Okay. Um, you know, I, I understand about batteries and I have a, uh, a regular Prius and my son has a plug-in Prius. I have 250,000 well, 250, miles on our car. We just switched a battery out and it cost, it was a penny per mile what the cost was to replace that battery. And, you know, people have problems with range anxiety. That's the biggest problem with people buying a car with the battery. And then the cost to buy EV now has gone up. I did uh, put down for a Ford Lightning and it's got the application to actually purchase one. And to get the long range, uh, platinum is $90,000. The low end is 39. So, you know, when it comes to hydrogen, I understand what Toyo wants to do. How can we convince our state legislators to maybe go the California route, which anything that's built has to be built with green energy and can produce and sustain energy as well. Well, we're working on the legislators. We've got some champions. Uh, Chris Hansen's one of them. Um, we continue to make the point. And uh, I think eventually they start, a lot of them start to come around. And we're lucky right now that um, the world has awakened to the fact that climate change is real. I think that's motivating people. Uh, um, certainly, um, I mean, I'm, I know I'm close to hydrogen, but I'm hearing a lot in the press and other places about hydrogen. It's part of um, the federal legislation now. So it's changing. And we're frustrated because it has to change. It should have changed 20 years ago you know, this whole energy situation. We want it to happen fast, um, but based on the way other things have changed, it's happening pretty darn fast. And I think it'll continue to accelerate. And remember, change is already always logarithmic. It, it seems like it's not changing at all. And I, at some point you hit that hockey stick of the curve and things just really take off. I think Bill Gates said it the best when he said that we, we overestimate change in the next five years and we underestimate change in the next 10. And that kind of sums it up. So we just all have to keep working, uh, just keep working on it. Right. And I, it, and I believe all of, all of our trunk lines, uh, what infrastructure is put in, really should have 
the water turbines in the system because water is always flowing, whether it's solids or weight, solids or water, it's always flowing. And we need to capture that energy. And we need to think long-term. I, I saw, I had to, uh, the uh, opportunity up in Seattle a few years back to see those turbines get put into water systems in the, in the trunk lines and neighborhoods, a replacement. And it, yeah, it was costly, but over, over time, you would make up for that. So, you know, we need to think outside the box and, and we just have old technology, the old ways of doing things. And we don't think when it comes to multi-functioning and getting, the, and getting energy out of the things we use every day, they don't think that. I mean, we need to start changing the way we uh, uh, put infrastructure in. Sorry. Well, it, it, Steve, it's interesting you mentioned um, uh, detri- or getting energy out of water systems. There's a company that's a member of the Colorado Hydrogen Network called Hydrocosm. They're actually in New York. And most municipal water systems have regulating valves that just simply throttle down the flow of water and just dissipate that as a little bit of heat. And what Hydrocosm has done is they're putting little very tiny um, impeller generators on those to generate electricity. And then they'd like to turn that into hydrogen that can be either stored or used. So that, that's a great idea. We've got another member on the Western slope here that's also trying to use the, the more rural water systems to uh, generate electricity instead of just wasting that energy. So a lot of great ideas on things like that out there. Yeah, guys, I think it's, uh, I think it's time to wrap up. Um, <laughs> So um, listen, I want to thank um, I want to thank Brian. Brian, thank you for taking part in this uh, webinar. Thank you very much, uh, Claire. Thank you very much for for keeping everything uh, together from not uh, falling apart. Um, Lauren, thank you too for running things uh, behind the, the scenes there. Appreciate your help. And with that, I think we should all say um, uh, good night. Uh, thank you all for coming and good night. Thanks for doing this, Harv. You're welcome. Thanks, all. Thank you, everybody.